featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Welcome to Your Money, Your Call. It's Bonds versus Equities. I'm Mark Todd from Fixed Securities. And if you have any questions tonight about the share or bond market, please feel free to pick up the phone and call us on 1300 30 34 35 and email yourmoney at skynews.com.au. Joining me tonight is Chris Weston, who is the Chief Strategist for IG Markets, and David Stewart, the Chief Strategist for Mercer. As I said last time, two chiefs, one Indian. Um, <laughs> hello, boys. How are you? Not too bad. Very well, thank you. Um, How's your week been? It's, it's, uh, t tell me a little bit about IG Markets. How's that all going? Uh, IG are the, the world's biggest co uh, contract for difference provider, CFD yep. provider, and uh, the biggest retail effects provider in Australia. Uh, all products we do are, are leverage instruments, so they do carry a little bit more risk, or a, a, more, a lot more risk than... Sorry, just wait, it's the biggest FX provider, is it? Retail FX provider. Right, OK. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, people like Citigroup and Deutsche would yeah, be... Yeah. You know, doing much Who are your competitors on that FX front? Is there, is there somebody else that's about to get listed? It's, I just remember seeing a, a, a yeah, snapshot. Yeah, Invast. Invast are the, the, the new guys. I mean, you've probably seen Peter Esho. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Show quite a lot. He, was on a, he was on a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so he's, that, that's, they're, they're a Japanese firm. They're coming in. Um, uh, CMC, uh, FXCM, yep. GFT, uh, City Index, those kind of players. But you guys are the biggest? We've got the biggest uh, market share in Australia. Yeah, we've got about twenty percent market share in, in, in that space. In the re in the CFD space, um, you know, we're, we're the biggest in the world. Um, yeah, we've got offices all around the world, thirteen different locations. So basically, it, the, the whole idea between contracts for differences is that you can um, take a view on any different asset class you want to do. Uh, you don't take a, take delivery of any contracts, um, but you're just speculating on on the outcome of a price event. So if you like, if you think BHP is going to go up you buy it, but you place a small deposit down, and therefore you're trading these instruments on leverage. And in terms of that business, you know, how do you, how do you ensure that the guy that's, you know, the leverage piece, is it a very short stop loss on these guys? Is that how it works? So that if somebody wants to bet on BHP, you know, you're going to give him some leverage, but at the same time, you, you keep a very tight rein on them? Yeah, I mean, if it depends on the asset class, um, it will depend on the amount of leverage you get. Yeah. Uh, in the stock market, there is a set amount of leverage. BHP, for example, you would get 20 times leverage. You'd put 5% of the total equity down on that position. Um, you would always trade off the, the guaranteed market price, and yep. that's you're just speculating on the outcome. But it is, I mean, the, the way to make money trading these products is, is to have a very strong risk management system. I mean, you know, you've probably heard that most traders lose money. Yep. The whole idea is that you have to have... They never admit to it and they're really arrogant about it anyway, no, but well, they do, they, they all lose the money. Way to, the way to, to make money in these, in these markets is to know to admit that you're wrong. Have a stop loss. You, you can determine where you place your stop loss. Um, but make sure the, the money you make on your winning trade is significantly more than the money you lose on your losing trade. That way you can get 40% of your trades right, for example, and over the course of the year you make money. Should work. A lot of people regardless of whether they're trading CFDs, FX, commodities, whatever they are, whether yep. they're trading physical stock, will take their profits far too early yeah. and they'll, they'll let, will let their losses run. I and mean, that's why, you know, you probably, that's why people lose money. It's a very simple equation. Like I, I couldn't agree more. I sold CBA at $58. <laughs> <laughs> How's life at Mercer? How are things going there? Uh, as a more medium term view, as you know, so uh, it's been an interesting week, as you say, there's been quite a lot going on in markets, but uh, most of our investors are medium to long term investors we typically advise in you know major institutions, major institutions. so uh, when when you last came on the show we would we were about to hit the Bernanke put and he said <laughs> i'm taking that put away and you can just free fall um, what, what's your view now? What's, what's happened since he's come back and said, whoops, you know, let's, let's differentiate between them, which is interesting. And we can talk about it a little later. He's differentiated between QE and interest rates. Yeah. He, he's been quite good at doing that. Bernanke's proving to be um, quite competent in managing messages. So he gave everyone a real shock for a couple of weeks. That was when you were on the show. What's, what's your thoughts now? Because you were saying just, you know, buy through the volatility. The, yeah, the look, I think, I mean, Bernanke clearly has, has always said that he needs to educate the market in order to try and avoid the market making major moves. So one of his 
aims in monetary policy is to be give forward guidance all the time. I thought I heard a very good analogy actually of what he did. I mean, what we heard was the fire alarm go off when Bernanke made his first speech about withdrawing QE. The question is, was that a fire drill? Was it a false alarm? Or was it actually a real fire? And I think the answer is it was a fire drill. Um, it wasn't a false alarm because this is going to happen sometime. If that tapering is going to happen, quantitative easing is going to end. So it is a drill so that we know what's going to happen in advance. Was it a real fire? We don't think so, not at the moment. We don't think there's a fire in, in the US economy. Well, we can talk about the US economy in a minute, but let's talk about volatility. You must think that that's, I mean, clearly that's a good part for your customers. They need that volatility, otherwise the leverage piece wouldn't work. Yeah, that's right. I mean. Um, our, our company is listed on, on the FTSE and we're seen very much as a, a hedge against volatility. Clients, short term clients love volatility, they love yeah. big price movements, they pr probably prefer, well, you know, the, most of them prefer a trend. Yeah. Yeah, most of our clients uh, prefer buying into strength, uh, selling into weakness, uh, rather than very, very choppy range trading markets. But certainly when there's big volatile moves, that's why our clients you know, thrive around. And how about your clients for the volatility uh, base? Do the, do the industry super funds come to you and say, this is giving me a headache, or do they say, well, it's not really my money, I don't care? Look, most of the, most of the, the industry funds would, would be aware that they have to try and look through this and they don't react too much to volatility. Their problem is uh, sometimes their members do. So we saw that when we had extreme volatility during the GFC, that a lot of members moved to cash probably at exactly the wrong time. And so I think industry funds are actually putting a lot of effort into trying to get close to their members and educate them more so that members don't panic when volatility rises. Uh, and are they proving successful about that? Because I do well, know that when, when um, John Pearce from, from Unisuper was on the show, he was making the point that they did the analysis, if you had just stayed with the, the balanced portfolio that they had, your performance over the medium term would be fantastic. But it was about absorbing that volatility and he said, very hard to get to those, those members, purely because the members have got a life to live. Mm. It's like the politicians, you only make a decision as you're walking up to the booth, all due respect to you know, a vast percentage of people. How do you get to your customers around the education piece, what, what, what do you do? Well, uh, our, our responsibility is to try and educate our clients and they then have to educate their members. So in one sense, we're one step before that. But the other thing we do is we try and help, uh, particularly websites have become quite important. As you say, members are a bit disengaged. It's not easy to speak to them. Annual reports possibly go in the bin rather than be read. And websites work quite well. And there's quite a lot of, uh, I think, good uh, illustrations coming out of uh, industry fund websites. I mean, we ourselves have, you know, a retirement income simulator which tells you, given where you are, what sort of income will you get when you're in retirement? And it's that sort of thing I think means a bit more to people than just, you know, their money's gone up by 10% or it's gone down by 10%. So, Chris, how many clients would IG have? Roughly. Well, globally, we've got over uh, over 110,000. So, how do you reckon they get to those customers in terms of that message that they'd want to do? What? How do you, you get to 110,000 people and talking about the services and the yeah. product availability? Because availability? clearly, you want to change your product and you want to talk to your clients on. How do you do that? Well, most of the stuff we do is, is on the website. To be honest, uh, we have uh, an education retail uh, research portal. Um, we want our clients to make money. You know, we make our money from spread, absolutely, and we make our money from commission. Uh, we don't make money when clients lose money. Some there are some CFD models which do. We don't. Right. So we want our clients to make money. It's in our interest to provide them with a good quality education. So we'll go out. We'll send them emails uh, and make sure that they can, you know, harness volatility to the best of their ability. Because for, for short-term traders, whether it's in the stock market. Uh, whether it's in the currency market, commodity market, you know, volatility can be your friend if you can, if you can understand the price action, understand what the market's saying, the psychology around that, and protect yourself in the right manner as well, using stops as well. If I'm a customer of IG, do I, am I online or am, do I have a, a person ringing me? What, how does that service, or do I have a combination of both? How does that work? Well, clients, well, we, we'll, we, they, everyone gets their own account manager, so we will try and make sure that you know, people understand what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but when people are au fait with the product, understand the platform, they don't really want to call in. They, they want to go on the, the, the website, log on to their account, they want to go online, iPad, iPhone. 30% of orders now are placed on the iPad. Really? Um, a lot of people will go and check positions throughout the day because they, the CFDs, by their general nature, do take a little bit more time. They're, you know, they're certainly very different from a yeah. set and forget product uh, or an income based strategy. I mean, 
people like to see what how their positions are going, react if 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 if, if, if they need to. So yeah, I mean, people generally don't place place orders over phone anymore. It's very much done through the increased technology we've seen over the last three or four years. If I was to have an IG customer come in the room here, am I looking at a young guy who's who's trying to who's got a job? and he's trying to punt to add to that job? Or am I looking at a retiree that's saying, I, I'm not, I need a bit of excitement and I like the idea of that? Or, or is, it, it, uh, is it a very diverse array of customers? No, it's, it's exactly the same as what you'd see with, with physical stock trading, people who are actively stock traders. Yeah. Um, they're usually male, uh, between the ages of mid-30s to, to mid-40s, uh, you know, reasonably wealthy. Um, but we would never suggest people, you know, we, we don't allow people to trade their superannuation accounts uh, through us, for example. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, well, I mean, it's just the leverage involved. I mean, no, it's because of the leverage that's involved. I mean, that that's the situation. But, you Are know, we were the only ones to do that, or do the, all of them not do that? Oh, I don't know about the rest of them, but we... we Can't we, speak well. Yeah, I mean, we, we try and make sure the standards are, are high where we can. Um, we, we do reject a reasonable amount of clients for having the lack of experience. Yep. Um, and we just want to make sure people have the understanding and because and, and, leverage at the end of the day, you know, can be a very, very powerful powerful tool if it's if it's utilised in the right way. Yeah, as the, the CEO of the National Australia Bank said, you need more debt. You know, <laughs> leverage is a good opportunity. Uh, we have to go to a very short break. Please feel free to give us a call on 1300 30 34 35. If you have any questions, you can email your money at skynews.com.au. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Mark Todd from Fig Securities, and joining me tonight is Chris Weston, Chief Strategist for IG Markets, and David Stewart, Chief Strategist for Mercer. They're here to answer any of your questions, so feel free to give us a call on 1300 30 34 35, and the email is yourmoney at skynews.com.au. And for regular viewers, uh, I'm not trying to look like something out of the pretenders. Uh, <laughs> I just left my glasses in the office, and he's the only one available in the home front. Um, We'll take a viewer email. The email is from Jane and she writes, I have only ever invested in term deposits and the four banks. Will term deposits go up soon and if not, should I buy more bank shares? I guess um, when I think of the response to Jane's email, um, it's not really a balanced portfolio. That, that's the first thing that stands out. Uh, and we don't know enough about her circumstances in terms of what, what she's doing. But term deposits are not going to go up. Um, no, I agree. Th th that's not going to happen. Not for in a long time. Not for a long time. And it's, and it's interesting that so many people have been... I, I sat in a plane, we went up to a conference, I sat in a plane with some guys who were on a golfing trip, and we just started chatting. And they all That's what they did, turn deposits. Mm -hmm. They just did, had no desire to get in the volatility equities, and you know, they wouldn't be IG customers. It's just it's, There's a whole big subsection of the world yeah. that need it. Mm -hmm. need I, I think the other thing that... We're going to be looking at, and, and there's, there's certainly a lot more increased rhetoric that the RBA might start looking giving forward guidance longer term, so mm. you can get a, get a general sense of how longer like, longer term rates will be, you know, sticking out long, you know, if that actually does materialise, and we'll get a sense then, you know, how the rate the rate curve is going to behave longer term. Uh, we haven't seen that materialise yet, but so it's, it does look like we're we're going to see a very low low rate environment for a period, long period of time. Well, in answering to Jane's email, I mean the, the thing that stands out to me is you need more diversity than just the four majors and you know, buy yeah. Telstra. But yeah. um, but it's all about the education. It's all about getting very comfortable working out how much money you want to put mm. into the market and having some more balance around that. You know, we would say you've got to have um, some move out of that turn deposit piece and maybe into some of the high yielding fixed income if you want some safety. But at the same time, you, you need to have more balance than just p picking four yeah, majors. I mean, a lot of it, you, you do have to it's look at what the are the objectives, how much income do you need and so forth. But uh, I think what's happening in Australia at the moment is what happened in the rest of the world two or three years ago. You know, interest rates are gradually getting so low, they're not good enough for people to, to get the income they require and people are having to look further afield. And they're going to have to take a little bit more risk if they want to keep the income where it was. Mm. Uh, they can try and mitigate that risk, as you say, by making sure you spread it across different investments. And that would be the primary you know, piece of advice you could but give you would someone. But you would see a sense of that crowding out with the way that the Fed has worked. And, we, and we'll talk a little bit later when we talk about cash rates around what the, the forward guidance is, because it's very interesting mm. at the moment how that's all changing. But the crowding out effect it isn't necessarily going to IG customers because they've probably got a desire to be that sort of trader, but the crowding out effect is affecting a lot of people who would have bought, bought turn deposits and they've gone from the very safe capital structure of turn deposits, government guaranteed, all that sort of stuff, down into the more riskier piece of the capital. Mm -hmm. And if they were buying CBA at $73 in June, it goes to 67 all of a sudden, hang on, 
this isn't a story I wrote. Mm. And, uh, and I think that's harder for people to get a grip on that volatility around that movement. What, you, what you're understanding the capital, uh, the capital structure, yeah. I think, is a challenge for everyone. Yeah, I think the other thing is, you know, banks, if you're just actually taking a view on the market right now, I think yeah. banks, banks still are, you, I'd be buying them on, on, on pullbacks at the moment. The, the yield's still very attractive at these levels. Um, there's not a huge amount of credit growth coming through. But the other sector which I'm starting to warm to now is, is the material space. We're starting to see some, some pretty rosy price action coming through there as well. And I think global growth is actually bottomed now. Mm -hmm. I think developed market growth will, will start picking up in 2014, 2015. And I think, you know, we're going to see commodity prices heading higher despite the, uh, the, the withdrawal of stimulus from, from, from the Fed. It'll be certainly challenging though, won't it? Because the, you, know, you see the, the, the Fed comes out and says, things are soft, things are weak. And they look to the politicians for some guidance. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And they say, man, it's, it's like a kindergarten. Yeah, I a weird agree with Chris though. I think You're the, very developed, bullish, world, right? no, you're the naturally developed world is improving. Yeah. Um, and the but US the in particular is doing better. Even the European numbers are looking a little bit it better looks, now. Europe looks better. But and but The problem is Australia's actually going the other way yeah. at the moment. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's why if you're just going out of turn deposits into Australian banks, actually you, you're in a market where the risk is rising. And probably why I would disagree a little, we're probably a little more concerned, again, with a more medium term view that the material sector probably had its great run in, over the last 10 years. It's not going to be the right place to be for the next 10 years. So what, where can you go? And the answer is not, not many places within the Australian market, which is why one of our main pieces of advice is look at trying to get some money overseas. Yes, I'd agree with that. And, and I think Europe's a really good place to be looking right now, both from a, a valuation perspective. But, you know, we're, we're talking about the PMI series now. You look at you look at Spain. Spain has moved from a current account deficit to a current account surplus. Still big deficit as a percentage of GDP. But the, you've got the the housing uh, excess is, is coming in. Um, you know, PMIs are improving in, 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 in Spain. Uh, peripheral Europe looks in a better space. And, unemployment's and what, 25% in Spain? Unemployment, uh, the unemployment 10 year bonds are at 4.30, we're at 3.30, well, you know, roughly. You, you sort of think, how did the Spanish get away with it? You know, they still have a sleep in the afternoon. You know, where's the structural reform that, that the Europeans will need? It, it, what do you see? In terms of, I want to buy Europe, I, I agree, I understand all that, I, I do get it, but you have to see that there's some sort of idea around unity, because the, the English are about to make a decision whether they want to be part of it, and there's no unity around... British. The British. <laughs> so not there's not no necessarily unity. if the Scots vote for devolution. That's right. <laughs> there's no unity around the idea of being one Europe. So it's, it's, I understand the, the, the price action I do, but if I was on the other side, I'd say, wow, Europe's still... It's just because it's gone away that it's become I, good value. I, I, I think the European problems are quite structural and so far there hasn't been an enormous amount of reform in the periphery. It's been bailing out the periphery and you need to see some reform going forward in the future. We'd see Europe as high risk, potentially high return. I agree it is cheap, but I'd probably be a little more comfortable in core Europe, Germany, France, yep. Scandinavia, and the UK. The UK has the big advantage of a floating exchange rate, so it's not, it's not tied to the German euro. So those markets, I think, are probably a lot safer than Spain. Italy and you know Portugal, even Ireland, which is just they're not in charge of their own destiny because of the they're Euro. too small. Yeah, yeah. That's the Euro. We're, we're going off the reservation a little bit, but if if uh, if we wanted to, to buy into the European story, high risk, good return, that sort of stuff, how do we do it? You know, what what do we do? Do we go to a fund manager and rely on that? Do we do that research via a fund manager, or do we do we buy? How do we buy directly into Europe? What, what's the idea around that? There's a lot of ETFs available now, which is the easy way to you know if you don't want to have to find a good fund manager and pay their fees. ETFs are a pretty cheap way of getting in. You get physical exposure to a market. You can use derivatives. You can use CFDs as well, but that's a, a little more complicated for the average investor. Can you get CFDs in the European? Assets. If I'm here, is is that something you do? We, like, we, we or offer, do I have a currency we offer, issues? We offer indices, global indices, yeah. um, DAX, CAC, IBEX, MEB, FTSE. Uh, and to be honest, if you if you are looking, it depends on you on on how long you want to hold the position. Um, you know, if you've got an ETF, you won't pay interest. Uh, we offer ETFs as well, but. Um, if you want to take a short-term view, I would always suggest trading the index as opposed to trading the ETF because you've got you're trading the absolute level rather than something that's based off it and also you you know the ETFs are only traded during the New York Stock Exchange hours as well whereas we make 24-hour markets on those. If you were taking the view that you were saying that Europe is good would it be better to buy the euro would it be something like that would that make sense if you were... <laughs> Depends if you buy it against the Australian dollar that's, yeah. that's done very nicely you wouldn't buy it against the US dollar 
because that's just been range trading at the moment. Yeah. It's been a very, very tough trade. Every analyst out there has been calling for 125, 120. Fair value, probably on a yield spread, would be probably closer to 125 at the moment. But it's been a very, very tough trade. Everyone's saying to me, why, why is euro dollar not lower than where it is? Well, you know, the actual IMF is calling for euro to have a current account surplus this year, a primary surplus of about 2.6%. I think that plays a massive part into the euro strength as well. Yeah. The data's been improving, although it's obviously coming off very low levels. But I think European companies, buy high quality European companies, um, would be a, a very, very good way to do that. Easy to do, easy, it's so easy to get, ex to, to get exposure to those companies we'll now. We'll talk about that after the next break. We have to go to another short break. Please feel free to give us a call on 1300 30 34 35 for any ideas you have, any questions you have on investing or strategy, and the email your money at skynews.com.au. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Mark Todd from Fig Securities. Joining me tonight is Chris Weston, a Chief Strategist for IG Markets and David Stewart, Chief Strategist for Mercer. They're here to answer any of your questions. Feel free to give us a call, 1300 30 34 and the email your money at skynews.com.au. Um, David, I want to talk to you about, I read the July Mercer um, outlook. Mm -hmm. And one of the themes that you were keen on is that post-retirement piece around the idea that people retire at 65, they've got X amount of money, they think that'll last for as long as they like, and then they're outliving that money and they're, they're turning around saying, hang on, that didn't quite work out, I don't travel anywhere. Yeah. Um, do you want to expand on that theme? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a, a very hot topic in, in the superannuation industry at the moment. Um, in, traditionally, we've focused on trying to maximise the size of your pension fund when you get to 65, uh, whilst managing risks as you approach it. In reality, 65 isn't your drop-dead day. You're going to live a lot longer than that. I think the average life expectancy is about 20 years for most people when they retire. Half the people live longer than that. That's mm. why it's the average. So. What we're trying to do now is to put in place a, a whole, what's called a whole of life structure whereby everything doesn't stop at 65. In fact, you have assets which gradually reduce the amount of risk and increase the amount of income so that you can live comfortably in retirement, but you still have an asset base to support you if you live a bit longer than you were expecting. So it's not based on the income, it's not based on, let's give them 5%. No, it, no. It's saying that the asset has to grow. And in fact, it's, it's based on what we call replacement income. So the idea is that you have a target for when you retire that you might want two thirds of your prior salary as replacement income. Remember, you don't yep. pay tax on it, so it's yep. worth a bit more. And probably your expenses have come down a little bit because you're not working anymore. And we try and maximise the period over which you can get that replacement income and also minimise the risk that it falls below maybe a certain threshold, at which point you're actually struggling. Yeah, right. I. I you know, the challenger ads have been very effective and it's and it's pointed to that point, hasn't it, Chris? You look at these people into the distance and they're saying, I just don't have enough money. So yeah. it, it's it's a, it's identified. The reason why it's so effective is because it's true. You know, a lot of people, certainly a lot of people come to figure and say, I thought I'd have X, I've now got Y, and I don't want to go back and, and trade the equity markets. D does that mean that portfolio construction becomes so much more important to all your customers? I mean, when you talk to a customer, um, the business that he's dealing with you, would you just assume that that's a small portion? Would you assume that's all of his money? How, how would they... Yeah, I mean, traditionally our, our, our customers, our clients, have, a, have exposure in, in, the, in, the, in the physical equity market as well, both through super and also through day trading products as well. Some of the guys I speak to, some of the clients I speak to will, will obviously look you know, longer term um, and, and obviously have a diversified portfolio where, where they can, not just stocks but obviously bonds as well. They'll they'll use CFDs as a, as a small portion which they can actively use yep. uh, within, within that total portfolio. One of the great things that I, I, I like about CFDs as well um, is, is how you can actually use it for, for hedging advices as well. So if you've got a, if you've got a, a reasonably big position in a, in a super for example, you can actually go and short a stock against your physical position. It's a lot cheaper to do that with a CFD rather than actually close your, your super for example. So you've got 100,000 Telstra. Yeah, you can go and, and you short, say, it. You short. Can short it. Um, using a CFD, leverage up, get max. If you think Telstra's going to have like a, a 50 cent decline or whatever, um, some unfounded rumours about uh, losing off. its div dividend or whatever it's or cutting back on its dividend, you can go and short a, a, a CFD against that. Mac, you know, make, make sure that your exposure nets off exactly and then close out 
close out the short leg when when you think that the, the uptrend is going to resume again. It's much cheaper than closing out the, the physical leg. Yeah, right. Uh, so they're they're quite good in that in that hedging portfolio as well, and we see a lot of people using that in the in the physical uh, market. How about yourself for portfolio well, construction? How's that? Yeah, I think what what we're trying to do is uh, the challenger products. I mean, they provide annuity, which is what you actually want in yep. retirement. But globally, the annuities are very hard to sell because people are shocked by how little income they get for a given amount of capital. And one of the things that we're trying to do is get the super funds effectively to create an investment portfolio which will provide that annuity on behalf of its default members. So they don't actually have to do anything. The super fund will do it for them. They'll manage that <coughs> asset allocation in order to make sure that they keep their re re income retirement. And and broadly speaking, how are we going to compile that? W what's the what's the essence of it? Well, that, the, I, everything's going to be different yeah. for different people. I, I get all that. But are we moving, does it, is it something that goes from equities into fixed income? It is, but it also, it's a, it's a bit more subtle than that. For example, it moves more from overseas equities back into Australian equities because yep. you get franking credits in Australian equities if you're a zero tax player. Yep. That's worth more than when you're a taxpayer. Um, you potentially also look at some high income real assets such as infrastructure assets or property assets. You know, these are commercial size assets rather than individual houses. And again, these are things where you may be able to get an income which will grow with inflation because the big issue is not just that you'll live too long but inflation will eat away at your income that's that's, that's the my problem music. with the term deposit that's my music you know i love the inflation piece we've got to <laughs> heads out inflation um tell me a little bit uh, in the article it was talking about um some of the credit products as well in terms of having a portfolio that is a diverse credit portfolio. Can, can you expand a little bit on, on yeah, what you thought about that? This is probably something which has come to Australia, as I say, because we're gradually living the life that investors overseas have had with very low interest rates, very low bond yields. Yeah. So your traditional fixed income investments aren't giving you the return you think you want. Are there ways you can get a bit more return without taking too much risk? And one of the areas we talk about is different types of fixed income, which do have a bit more risk, but as long as you spread that risk, you can boost your income and hopefully not take as much risk as equities. So, so what sort of sorry, jump in, what sort of strategies in the in the fixed income market? Would you look at things like steepeners and No, no, no. This is more this is at the asset allocation right, level. Okay. So we would be looking at diversifying, for example, into emerging market economy debt, um, yep. which does carry a bit more risk, but a much higher High yield. We'd be looking at higher higher yield debt, which is not so investment corporate, grade, corporate. but still uh, you we know, did a, has we less did a, risk than equity. We just did a bond issue for a company um, called uh, G8, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that's going to pay out over seven and a half percent. And that's you know it's a it's a, an ASX 200 company. They'll issue a small amount of debt, and for somebody's portfolio, you don't dive into all of it, yeah. but you, yeah. you can yeah. get residential mortgage-backed securities that are double-A rated and you'll get 300 over the cash rate. You, you, those sort of things, as you get more sophisticated in the fixed income, you can, you can apply that some t some Telstra, yeah. some Westpac, and stock you've got to recognise it is high risk, so you don't just move all your don't do all, all your cash and bonds into this sort of stuff. The other one is actually private debt or bank loans, uh, which is really a situation that's come about because of the increased regulation on banks. It's called BAL three, yeah. and that's causing banks to uh, try and move some of these loans off their balance sheet. And there's an opportunity for investors to buy those loans and earn quite decent returns. And that's coming to Australia now. Well, that was the same. Did you see the paper in Lloyd's? Lloyd's are shifting all their, you know, the, they don't know whether they're going to close Lloyd's up, you know, as a global entity leaves Australia, but they were saying that they just had to get these loans off their books, and mm. I think everyone's trying to do that. I mean, uh, Suncorp sold to Goldman's a whole bunch of loans. Mm. Now, rest assured, Goldman's going to make money out of that. That's just life. They have done it, but yeah. that doesn't actually mean that Suncorp were losers in the experience because it's the bar three. It's how does my balance sheet mm. look like? I take the haircut, but, you know, you're going to give me $5 billion worth of capital or, or free up $5 billion worth of capital. Uh, we have to go to another short break, but anyone, feel free to call us, one 300 30 or email skynews.com.au. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Mark Todd from Fig Securities. Joining me today is Chris Weston from IG Markets and David Stewart from Mercer. And we have our first call. It's Richard from Sydney. Hello, Richard. How are you? Hi, how are you, Mark? Um, look, I'm just uh, inquiring about uh, Transurban. Are there any bonds associated with uh, 
the uh, transurban staple, you know, the um, toll road operator, as uh, like uh, Sydney Airport. Also, a question for Chris on transurban. I noted in the Fin review today, its uh, result was earnings per share of about 11.5 cents. Yet they're paying out a 15 cent uh, dividend. Is this an accounting trick? I, I realised about three or four years ago they are paying out dividends from earnings. Just uh, Chris's um, um, opinion on that. Thank you, fellas. Yeah. I, I in terms of individual stocks, it's probably not good to talk about individual stocks yeah. because that gets you in a little bit of trouble. But in terms of companies that pay out dividends more than they earn, um, we've had a few people, you know, who are investment experts, experts saying that's probably not a good idea. Uh, last I looked, that wasn't a good idea. Would you agree? <laughs> in the long run, it doesn't generally work. But what you've got to be careful of, I think, with some of these companies, uh, it's a very unusual company with obviously a massive uh, asset uh, and, and a lot of income coming off of that asset. Uh, the question with the earnings, to my mind, would be how is that asset being depreciated? And if the depreciation is too aggressive uh, for the value of the asset, that might lead to a, fa a situation where your cash flow is higher than your earnings indefinitely. But look, I, I don't know this individual balance sheet yeah. well enough to know whether that's the case here. Yeah. So and the most things. of the time, it's something you'd be careful of. Yeah, and they're the things you look for. And in terms of the... Um the transurban bonds. I'll have to come back to you next week on that one. But but I can tell you that a lot of the infrastructure bonds are incredibly popular. Duet own um, infrastructure bonds. Dampier Bunbury Natural Gas Pipeline trades at six percent. The, the stocks trades at seven. You, there are, you, if you look at some of these infrastructure plays, Investro have got some great bonds. Um, they've got some inflation linked bonds that are very popular with the customers. So it's interesting to see that if you have an infrastructure company. Just look for what assets they own because they might be putting some debt around those assets and looking to buy those debts. Mm -hmm. And I think if you get infrastructure between five and three quarters and six percent as a portion of your portfolio, they become quite attractive options. Yeah, right. I mean, I just I don't know much about I don't know the fundamentals of of, of tra Transurban itself, but you know there is always a. I think when you're looking at a company uh, and their dividend yield, you've got to actually work out. The, the quality of that dividend yield as well is it because earnings are are terrible or is it just because yeah. they're paying an extraordinarily high yield a uh, high dividend and, and you know I, I could comment on that situation there um, we have our second email for the day it is uh, from Steve from Perth and Steve writes um, I am approaching retirement and I'm going to take control of my superannuation fund my friends all buy bank shares is that a good place to start and Stephen's coming from Perth can I ask you about not necessarily where that's a good place to start but just talk about the various sectors that people would look at what did you think was the best performer of late well just to take a step back i think if you're going to have a, a a diversified portfolio you have to have banks in there there's there's no doubt about that um and you'd be looking at yeah the, the top four apart from uh, over the regionals in, in in my mind the actual best performing sector this year is the discretionary sector up 25 percent the sector that i've really liked uh has been the healthcare space i mean resmed uh you know came out of an earnings report amazing quality you know the margins these guys are squeezing out is huge mm. and i'm still a big believer that the euro aussie is going to continue going up um i think that the aussie dollar will probably get down to about 85 cents this year um, driven predominantly now by negative real rates which will be coming out later this year I think and I think the healthcare space is, is extremely leveraged to a, to a falling Aussie dollar or Aussie euro so I still think that's a fantastic place to be even though you know the, the, the value trader in me or the value investor in me says yes that the, the price earnings are becoming uh, a little bit elevated now but from a momentum sp space that, that, that's the place to be at the moment. Just, um just for the viewers at home, do you want to walk back a little bit on um, negative real rates and what you mean by that? Because I think that's an interesting point. Well, there's, there's, there's a, you know, if you've got a, a cash rate, let's just use the cash rate, for example, in, two in, this, three quarters, in this situation. Maybe down to two and a half. Yeah, so once inflation goes above the level of, of the cash rate, that's what we call negative real rates, you can have a similar uh, mantra in the bond market, for example, you can have negative bond rates where the inflation actually is, is, is higher than than the level of, uh, of, of the yield. Are you worried about negative real rates in the Australian economy at the moment? I think that we could get there, but I don't think um, they're likely to stay negative for very long, unless uh, there's an external shock. And I think this is where the Australian economy is at a high risk juncture at the moment. And if China continues to slow 
in the same way as it has over the last 12 months, I think that's when you start to worry a bit that the Australian economy might start to look a bit more like some of the other developed market economies with incredibly low rates uh, and a very difficult environment for investors. Because but I'd agree the Aussie dollar would probably be much, much lower. It would probably have a seven in front of it if uh, we got into that situation. But is that the benefit of having that floating dollar? You know, we have that seven, yeah. we have that 85 and we're able to export out of it. Do you feel there's a, a sense that those people who've been able to still live in manufacturing, tourism, education, all those currency-related industries, um, what happens with the lower currency? Do they just bank it? Or do you think it becomes stimulatory? Do they start spending that money? Take some of their hedges off the table, I'd imagine. First. Well, it'll be that. It'll be that. <laughs> I don't know how much the uh, education piece is hedged, but but do you know what I mean? Like in terms of Indian people coming there and the the, the as students, and you'd know that both coming from Melbourne. Thank you for well, coming up. <laughs> well, you talked about um, G8. Uh, yeah, the, the G8 education provider. Yeah, they they do. Um, uh, healthcare, uh, not healthcare. They um, uh, care for the kids, so childcare. Well, if you if you look at some, if you look at a stock like Navitas, for example, um, which has done very very well, if you look at the chart, it's, it starts at the bottom left and finishes at the top right. It's a beautiful looking trend. Um, that's just seen as a very much a hedge against uh, the, you know, the, the Australian dollar. So yeah. yeah, these are the sort of places that I'd be I'd be continuing to look at the moment, and these are the sort of places which are going to see continued inflows of, of students from India, from China, which their business model is, is very much thrived on as well. So they're the companies I'd be looking at there. Um, how important to all of this is the U.S. economy? Because if we see China getting weak, we need a global driver. We've we've seen that Europe is siesta. Um, how important does the U.S. become in that climate where, where China is getting softer? The, the U.S. is still the largest economy in the world, so it, it is important. But unfortunately, Australia's exports are very oriented towards China and Japan and not to the U.S. So the direct effect on Australia of the U.S. recovery isn't nearly as great as it is for many other countries. But there will be an indirect effect as the U.S. economy recovers and that spreads around the world. I mean, that will help China. That will help other parts of Asia. They export to the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. And so eventually it will come back to Australia, but Australia isn't the best place, market or economy, to benefit from a US recovery. Yeah, 35% of all Australian exports go to China, makes up about 6% 6 of the GDP that we have. So, yeah, as you rightly point out, it's, it's a huge play. I, I, I think China will grow at 7 7.5%. I, I don't see it having a six-handle. I think what they're doing at the moment will be enough directing capital around different parts of the economy you know keeping the money markets flush through reverse repos us will grow next year three three and a half percent in my mind and, and i think the market will become more au fait with um with what the fed are doing you know that with the lack of stimulus and relying with going back onto a more organic growth model in, in, in both your strategic minds at at uh Seven to seven and a half percent Chinese growth. Does that sustain the thirty-five percent that you're talking about exports, or do we see at seven to seven and a half? Do we start to see that move down, or is it such that it changes the exports? So they don't need the iron ore; they need something else. The exports will, will stay at thirty-five because there's no one else who wants most of the stuff we're exporting to China. I mean, they're taking all of the iron ore and the coal because they've become the biggest steel producer in the world, and there's no one else going to fill that gap. The point is that of that seven to seven and a half, it won't necessarily be that amount for the steel industry because they seem to have overcapacity in a lot of these industries. So what we're saying is that Chinese growth will not only be lower, but it will be less less commodity intensive than it's been in the past, which is why we do see a very big headwind for the Aussie for the Aussie economy. But the falling dollar will help. I mean, I agree with Chris that the idea is that there's a lot of companies who are really hurt with the Aussie dollar close to parity, and we need them to start try and pick up the slack when when the mining because that's what Stephen's just talking about moving the people out of the mining into other sectors and we haven't been able to do it he, well, he hasn't been able to do it we had a chart up here showing he moved the currency he, sorry he moved the interest rates down the currency just kept going higher mm. and he was would have been scratching his head saying this just 20 years I've been doing this it, it, this is not how it's supposed to work yeah. And I, th I think he is now looking at the currency in a much more radical light than, it, than, than he has been. And I think he wants to use the cur currency much more as a, as a pro-growth tool going forward. But that's the other thing as well. I mean, you are looking at commodities. You've mentioned the oversupply in the iron ore market. That's going to increase next year. But if you look at commodities now for, for our mining stocks, commodities priced in Australian dollars are actually looking much more attractive as well. So that's going to certainly help a lot of these, these companies longer term. We have to go to another short break, but please feel free to give us a call on 1300 30 34 35 for any questions you have. The email your money at skynews.com.au will be right back.
Welcome back to Bonds versus Equities. It's the edition of Your Money, Your Call. We're still taking all your calls, so please call on 1300 30 34 35 and email, as you know, your money at skynews.com.au. Um, the US, rally, rally, rally. Uh, Japan. Abenomics, he's got his structural issues. Um, you know, we do trot out the thing about the nappies, how there's more adult nappies than children's. But, but the, th the other point I was reading a Bloomberg article on the weekend, in 1916, one in 20 people were over 65. Today, one in four. Mm. There's your problem. It's just they keep on and they, and they don't give in. Well, there's villages where there's whole pe the whole village is, there's no one under 15. It's yeah. just the demographics is, is crazy. And of course, you have to produce more and you have to extract more from your workforce as that happens. And yeah, we're just not seeing that at the moment. So what well, do you think? Well, ultimately, they, immigration is one of the solutions to their problems, but that seems to be a cultural anathema to the Japanese, unfortunately. And so it seems unlikely it's going to happen. So this is a bit like Europe. They've got a structural problem stuck with the euro. It's not a great idea, but they're going to try and work with it. Japan stuck with zero immigration and with an aging population the economy is just going to keep keep bumping along the bottom. We're going to take a call from Fred uh, to talk about something else but we, we'll get back to that because it's the idea of how you change that cultural change and that's mm. the greatest problem. Um, hello Fred, how can we help you? Yeah, well, I'm retired and looking for a year like everybody is. What do you think of these bank floats? The ANZ recently did a hybrid float, 3.41% over the bank rate. What do you think of those products? Um, I think in terms of the products themselves, uh, they're, great for, they're great for the investor, they're great for the bank. They're cheap for sources of funds. No institution wants to buy them because they can get better uh, alternatives elsewhere. But in terms of as a portion of your portfolio, I think from a risk perspective, any of the four majors are, are quite good risk. Um, I think over the long term, it's a five-year deal. I guess cash rates will be somewhere like two and a quarter over the period, two and a quarter percent. So you'll get something close to you know, five and a half over that period of time. Uh, is that an appropriate return? I wouldn't suggest you'd put all your money into that. I don't think five and a half is, is the, the complete bang for your bucks. And I do think there's options of getting slightly better returns. I think you can get some fixed rate returns that go to 2018, 2020, and you'll get closer to 6% and it'll be fixed. You won't have that floating piece of some concern. But I do think, Fred, that you should have a little bit of both. So you'll, you'll have some good hybrids. I think um, uh, Crown has got a hybrid that's probably, I'm not as keen on the Crown one, but there are definitely some hybrids around there where you can get some great options. I just don't know whether that's the best one in, in ANZ. And I, you two are not going to speak about ANZ <laughs> hybrid, I know that. Um, you so, did so well. <laughs> so Fred, feel free to, to call us at, at FIG or send us an email and we can go through a different array of options for you, but it, it's not a bad option. Um, Japan, it's it's all about that change in culture. How, how do you how do you go about it? it? I suppose, Chris, the problem I see is that if you are 85 years of age and I'm you've lived in Japan, and I'm now going to say I'm going to bring Chris, my English friend, and he's going to work in Japan. He, he, the 85 year old doesn't necessarily want you to to do it. He, it they, there is no embrace. You know, they're not embracing immigration reform, are they? No. No, I think to change the cultural situation is, is something that's going to take a lot more than what we're seeing at the moment. The whole thing for Abenomics for me is, is to, export, to see Japanese export long-term capital. That's what we need to see. We're seeing signs of that in, in, the, in, the, in the weekly fund flows that we see from, from, the, from the MOF. But inflation, is, is, they're not creating inflation yet and, and they have to do something to create cultural change and, and, and get people to spend money not look at JGBs and actually go at you know, other assets and riskier assets in the market and that's just going to take a long long time at the moment. Um, I think the market gives them the benefit of the doubt for now but there will come a time when people just say they can double the monetary base but we're going to, we're going to sell, we're going to start buying yen again in a big way. And if that's the case, what happens to the rest of the global growth? If Japan's story is, if Abe doesn't, if he's not successful, it's the second biggest economy in the world, if he's not successful, what happens? Well, we've had this situation in Japan for the best part of 20 years now, so the global economy can survive without Japan. It's primarily been an exporter rather than an importer of 
you know, overseas goods, it exports more than it imports in general. So the world has got by without Japan. It would be a better place if Japan became more dynamic. But I think really it's more likely that the emerging economies will provide that extra growth for the developed world rather than looking to Japan. Could you agree? We, yeah, can, we can miss Japan. It can just be Japan a bypass. It's just a, a place to holiday. Look, I think, I think there, is some, there are some attractive uh, aspects of... Of, of Japan um, from an equity perspective um, but I think dollar yen is, is the key there every one cent move in, in dollar yen translates into 2.7 billion for the, the top uh, 2.7 billion yeah, 2.7 billion for the top 27 exporters now I think a lot of that will be driven by the dollar side of thing I'm a, I'm a big dollar US dollar ball over the next couple of years uh, so there are some 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 aspects to like about Japan um, but you know right now I wouldn't be going significantly overweight on the area by any means, and I don't think it's going to be the big driver of global growth anytime soon. It's time for a short break. We'll be right back in just a moment. Welcome back. Joining me tonight is Chris Weston, Chief Strategist for IG Markets, and David Stewart, Chief Strategist for Mercer, and they're here to answer any of your questions. Uh, let's talk about cash rates. Cash rates in Australia, we I think what happens you know, next week, August, do we get a, a cut in cash rates? Uh, if they don't cut, they're going to be seeing something that the rest of us clearly don't see. I mean, Stevens, during his midweek speech, basically came out and, and told us that he's going to cut. And, uh, yeah, woe behold anyone who's, uh, who's short Australian dollars if, if, he, if he leaves them on hold because there's going to be a massive spike. But, you know, the, the, the cash rate will come down, um, which leaves five weeks till an election, which is... I think the first time they've done it that close since 2007 when um, John Howard was in power and they, they put rates up by 25 basis points yeah. then. So there will be an election probably 27th of September and I think they'll be putting rates again down probably October or November. So I'm calling, I'm, I, I believe there'll be two, two cuts this year. So they go two and a quarter by the end of the year? Yeah. 25 each time, what would you think? Yeah, I think that's probably about right. Uh, whether it's by September or whether October, whether it's later in the year, I'm not too sure. But I think there's probably at least two more rate cuts to come. The one thing that might stop them is if the exchange rate falls significantly in the yeah. next few. And clearly we've seen some weakness um, over the last six weeks, we've seen some more weakness today. And that's the one thing that could put them on hold. But I, I feel that goes back to Fred's earlier question. If I buy the hybrid and it's linked to the lowering of cash rates, I just feel that we will have a very low cash rate. We think it's going to be mm. two and a quarter, but we have no supporting evidence because we're in uncharted territory so if the the currency doesn't go where we needed to do and you know we could end up at two for much longer so let's let's talk about the fact that uh in terms of fred he can still buy you know high grade corporate at six percent but for the rest of us who are dealing with cash rates we've seen carney the bank of england for the first time he's come over from canada he's saying right i'm going to give you some forward guidance draghi said i'll give you some forward guidance and he's saying cash rates are not going to go up but Anki said the same thing. He separated QE from the cash rates. They're not going up. So we can't go up. We, mm -hmm. we literally can't go up because of the effect on our currency. That would be a disaster. Mm -hmm. So globally, where are cash rates? What are the, what's, when do they start lifting cash rates? Um, well, I think each, each economy's got its own different thing. I mean, first of all, there's, there's, we've got a lot of economies that still need to come out of bond buying. For example, the US, that's the start of a normalization yeah. process. But, but hang on, but to an extent they've got their own, but they're all in, yeah, intimately linked. So the US can't go out and the rest are staying very low. They're all going to move together because it's just the effect on currencies. It's uh, I don't know. I mean, I think the, it's pretty clear when the US are currently looking to, to put cash rates up. If you look at Fed fund futures at the moment, that what I like, and you talk about Bernanke, he has done a fantastic job in making sure that the bond market and the Fed are singing off the same song sheet. Absolutely. The tapering can happen wherever. It can happen tomorrow, it can happen in two years. We don't care. Tapering will happen. Yeah. It's about the Fed funds rate. And the Fed funds rate at the moment is looking like 2015. Both the Fed fund future yeah. and the Fed are both exactly where they need to be. And he's, he's, it's taken him a while to drum it in, but he's got there. Yeah. I think the euro um, has, still has a lot of issues, and I don't think they're going to be putting rates up. They're still talking about negative deposit rates. Yeah. In, so that, that's not going up anytime soon. Banking, but we're still 2015, 2016 for that one. Probably 2016, I'd say, yep. more, more, more like that. I don't think we're going to see negative deposit rates in, in Europe at the moment. I just think there's too many untapped. Um, 
I think that I'd, I'd like to see you know inflation be nice if inflation came down and then sterling would would really come, you know come off pretty sharply. Look how you just say so happy about sterling. <laughs> what do you think cash rates globally? No, I, I wouldn't strongly disagree. I think the U.S. is likely to be the first. It's the the, the major developed economy that's recovering at the moment. Probably late 2015, but if we're positively surprised on growth, it could be a little bit earlier than that. But I, I don't think that will worry equity markets too much. They like the growth. Uh, I think the rest of the world is behind that. I think Europe may be a, at least a year behind the US, um, and the UK is probably somewhere in between those two. If you want to, if you want to, the bank who's going to be the first is going to be the, the RBNZ. I mean, they they have a very small bearing on the global economy, of course, but from a currency perspective, which I, I focus very heavily on the cu currency perspective, that's why Aussie Kiwi have done well. They've got the highest real rates in, in the G10 in New yeah. Zealand, and they're going to be the first to put rates up. I mean, well, I think they'll probably put them up in, in Q1. Uh, Canada would probably would be another bank that's going to be likely to put up rates before anyone else. Um, and then, you know, you've got the Scandinavians as well who might be doing stuff further down the line. Um, before We're going to go to a break soon, but I just want you to think about the one thing, because we run out of time so quickly, is the bank levy. So I'll give you some t chance to think. We're going to go off that reservation. Have a, we'll go to a quick break and we'll come back and chat about the bank levy and the Labor Party. So we'll be straight back in a second. The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.